Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Welcome. Come on down. I think it's just a few minutes after 10, and so in the interest of starting on time, we are so thrilled for the few that are here. Um, we are a small, intimate group, and we hope to have lots of discussion, both amongst ourselves, amongst the panelists, uh, with everyone here. And so uh, thank you for joining us on this early Saturday morning uh, to talk advancing gender in urology um, and allyship for men and advocacy for women. And again, despite our small numbers in the room, we do have some folks who are at home on live stream. Um, you all are welcome. Welcome as well. We'll get underway. My name is Simone Thavisilin. I'm an associate professor of urology at Brown in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, there are a couple of housekeeping issues here. For the first uh, is that the uh, AUA policy states that all planners and authors uh, should disclose uh, prior to their presentation any financial relationships or commercial interests. We will do so with a disclosure slide. Um, all of our materials are available on the website and the mobile app. Um, and uh, we do have a, an audience response pre-test question, which you'll need your cell phone in order to uh, image the QR code and to be able to do the questions, which we'll, we'll tackle first. Uh, but first, the biggest pleasure of today is to invite you to uh, uh, introduce these colleagues that I have. Uh, so I will uh, start with Dr. Kancha Mehta uh, from Emory, Dr. Matthew Sorensen from University of Washington, Dr. Maria Uloko, from UCSD, and Dr. Sam Chang from Vanderbilt. Um, I would love for all of you uh, in the audience to just go ahead and introduce yourself as well. We'll just start from this side and go that way. Um, welcome. And I'll repeat your names just because of the folks at home. Welcome, Jyoti Chohan. Go ahead. Welcome, Callie, a third year medical student. Welcome, Connor Rodriguez, a fourth year medical student. Liz Tech is from the Department of Neurology at Iowa. Welcome, Professor Nick Lowe. And Dr. Liz Tech is from Iowa. Welcome, guys. We're, we're thrilled to have you. It's a small but mighty crowd. Uh, the first uh, portion of this is the slide decks. So if you all want to. Um, fire up the questions. So again, I'll ask you to get your cell phone out just to be able to image this QR code uh, that'll allow you to access the questions. This should take you to kind of a polling process. And for the folks at home, there is a little bit of delay uh, with this. So in case you notice that, uh, that we move a slide ahead of you, that's just all part of the kinks of the system. So starting with pretest question, audience response system number one, uh, gender bias operates in urology by affecting women's career success, advancement, and ability to care for patients at the individual and institutional levels. Select the false answer. Women are more likely than men to receive awards and recognition for their expertise. Women are promoted to associate and full professor quicker and more commonly than men. Women authors are more likely to be cited or describe their findings as novel or promising. The practice patterns of women to provide full scope urologic care to patients is not affected by their gender. So if you wanna go ahead and uh, choose your answer, your results will not be appearing here. And we're asked to give you a little bit of time to make sure you have an opportunity to respond. And we'll give you a heads up uh, that again, your answers will be shared. And the post-test happens uh, after the meeting is over. Great, we'll move to the next question. Allyship requires speaking up when microaggressions occur to create inclusion. Strategies to do this include which of the following? Privately, but not publicly, disagreeing with the point of view. Asking for clarification, inquiring to gain further understanding. Avoiding addressing to prevent embarrassment maintaining the status quo to prevent confrontation. And here again, we'll allow our participants some time to select an answer. And those answers won't be shared. They are private.
And that'll take us to our third question out of five. Dr. Silver defines the triple threat of institutional and structural sexism and bias as that which occurs via the employer, academic journals, and professional societies. How does the leaky pipeline of academic medicine function? Individual women choose to work less and drop out. Each level of threat can be more profound for women with intersectional identity. Academic journals and professional societies and awards are equally distributed among genders. And again, for those at home, you might notice a delay that is part of the system. That takes us to question four or five. Which of the following is an appropriate strategy for addressing salary equity in urology? Amplify women colleagues through citation, promotion, mentorship, and sponsorship. Rationalize why gender-related pay gaps may exist. Avoid transparency in pay and other reimbursement structures. Rely on women to negotiate higher starting salaries. And then our fifth and final question. Median salary for women urologists is approximately $80,000 less than male urologists. Factors contributing to this disparity include women work less hours than men, women are less likely to be fellowship trained, women urologists spend more hours on non-renumerative clinical activities compared to male urologists, women earn more industry-related compensation payments. And with that final question, we'll switch the slide deck to our presentation um, and start our conversation and engagement of uh, discussion and welcome Sharon Stover. Um, we have previously introduced ourselves. Sharon leads HR uh, at the AUA. Um, so we're pleased to have you join us. Um, I have introduced our panel. These are our disclosures, uh, most of which aren't specifically relevant to our topic today. But our goal here is to recognize how gender bias operates uh, within medicine and specifically in urology um, and how it affects the career success and trajectory of women within urology and their ability to care for patients and work within healthcare systems at, at the individual and institutional levels. Our goal is to develop and discuss amongst ourselves strategies for allyship and advocacy um, by practicing identifying uh, and mitigating micro and macro aggressions uh, in the workplace and using techniques to interrupt and validate uh, and be an active bystander or an ally and to identify the intersectionality issues and gender equity and how social identity and institutional structural sexism interact. Yeah, I'll start with this quote from Dr. Julie Silver and her work in the, uh, her time is now report. Uh, you know, to address the sense of urgency that I think exists along the lines of improving equity for women in the workplace. Because the future has always been considered the ideal time to fix these issues. But the reality is that strategy hasn't worked well uh, for half the world's population. Um, and so there's no time like the present to make uh, micro changes in our, our environments, our learning environments, our clinical workplaces. And we hope today's discussion will start that. So where are women, uh, you know, we know that they're a growing proportion of the workforce. What are some typical case issues that come up uh, for women across the trajectory of their career? And how do we engage leaders, uh, both ourselves as leaders and our leadership in urology? I'll turn this over to Dr. Mehta to give a little bit of an overview of the demographics of women in urology. Thank you so much. And the way that this um, slide deck is structured and this room lends itself well to that because we have a small audience, we do want this to be a very interactive session. I think this is the only part where we will all be up here. After this, I'll be sort of down there in the audience. I'll have a microphone. We can pass it around so we can be engaged in discussion. This first part is just a little overview at our current numbers. And um, I will say that, you know, having this course, this is a second year we're doing this course here at the AUA. And last year we were at a 7 a.m. slot on like a Thursday or Friday, I forget. There were two or three other like huge competing courses happening at the same time and we were all very disappointed we got that time slot and this year we have a much better time slot so I do want to thank the AUA for recognizing that and putting us um, in this time slot. I'm, I'm happy about that. Well, um, the number of uh, practicing urologists, you see that in that light blue color and then you see the number of women urologists in that um, darker green color on the bottom and that 
number is steadily increasing, not exponentially, but steadily. I would say this growth is not uh, that different from women in other surgical specialties. There has been a slightly more exponential increase in some, in some surgical specialties. So I'm thinking orthopedics and neurosurgery, but they had very, very few women to begin with, like even worse than us. So um, any increase in number is, is exponential. But I would say for us, it's been a steady growth, which has been good to see. And um, the census data from this past year, I think we're up to 11% a little over 11%, almost 12% now, so the number is even higher. Um, and there you see those trajectories. Um, in terms of what our women urologists are doing and what type of practices they are working in, women are actually younger than men um, who are practicing currently, and this is not surprising, right? Most of the women who have entered the workforce as practicing urologists have done so in the last 10 to 15 years, as opposed to some of our older uh, urologic colleagues who are male and are now sort of in the population of urologists who are set to retire. So this demographic will shift again in another 10, 15, 20 years. These graphs will look very, very different. But currently, women are much younger on average than their male counterparts. And women are also more likely to be fellowship trained. And this is kind of an interesting phenomenon, right? So are women looking for fellowship training because they are definitely certain parts of urology that attract them um, because they all want to be in academic medicine or because they don't want to be pigeonholed into some parts of urology. I think that definitely played a role in my own um, fellowship training choice and I do male infertility and sexual medicine which couldn't be farther from female pelvic reconstructive surgery which is something I did not want to be pigeonholed into. Um, so that certainly played a role in my own choice and I think plays a role, continues to play a role in the choices that our current trainees make. But by virtue of being fellowship trained, by virtue of being more likely to practice in an academic uh, setting, women are also more likely to be involved in other endeavors beyond just clinical urology. So that includes research, that includes teaching and training our medical students, our residents. Um, so we do play a diverse variety of roles in the urologic enterprise, so to speak. Um, here you see, actually, I'm having a hard time seeing that number. <laughs> 21%. Man, I need glasses. Um, I don't even know what that graph is showing. Gosh. 21% out of... Women in the workforce that are under 45. That are under 45. Okay. And then this is 65% in terms of um, uh, training by um, fellowship. Uh, gender. Fellowship training. All right. So women are also more likely to practice in academic medical centers. We just talked about that and less likely to be in private practice. The graph on the left gives you some numbers uh, pertaining to that. Um, this is similar uh, to what we, what we just said. And here are the numbers in terms of a bar graph um, telling you about private practice, again, split by gender and age and that differential there. In terms of women, 37% almost, 36.8%, and then men slightly higher than that, 42.3%. Um, there was a question in the pretest about, you know, how much time we spend with patients. Um, women end up spending more time with each patient on average, and women and men work about the same number of hours per week. So this. Uh, preconception that, gosh, perhaps women urologists don't make as much because they're not as productive, that seems to be a fallacy in terms of total amount of clinical workload churned out that's equivalent. Uh, we do seem to do it either at a less efficient pace or um, at a more compassionate pace, however you want to look at it, but that face-to-face -face time with patients is higher. And every year on the AUA census, you know, it's a different set of questions. I saw that the, on this year's census, there was again this question about how much time you spend with patients. So I'm curious to see if the data will look any differently this year than when this was collected a few years ago. Um, on the left there is the average number of minutes spent with a patient, and this is, of course, a self-estimate. Um, you can see 16 versus 19 there. And on the right is the mean number of work hours per week. 
Um, and what you're doing in that work time obviously may look different depending on your practice. Um, I'm actually going to pass it back over to Dr. Tavasilin now for the next section, and I will. So as the number of women in urology increase, we have greater representation, uh, but the reality is that women face certain unique challenges. Uh, the, the issues of as, um, gaining career advancement and leadership um, are often affected by gender bias within the workplace. Uh, the sponsorship gap whereby you might get your next opportunity because it isn't just what you know but also who you know uh, can affect the ability of women to move into leadership roles. And this is described by Nancy Spector, who is the executive director of ELAM, um, a program to specifically train and advance women candidates into deanships and chair positions across the academic medicine uh, enterprise in the U.S., describes this as the sticky floor and the glass ceiling of mid-career invisibility, uh, where women might not get that first uh, a big leadership opportunity uh, in order to create name and reputation in order to be recognized as a leader within their institutions. Um, and this is very uh, commonly influenced by the in institutional or structural sexism that exists in recognizing women as leaders um, or in working for women who are leaders. So what we're going to start next is to define a little bit of the challenges that women face across the career trajectory in a rather longitudinal fashion, starting uh, at the student level and how we select uh, residents for, um, uh, for a, s a surgical subspecialty, what the match and experience looks like in, in interviews, which is different by gender, and then what it feels like to be a resident uh, as a woman. And I think there's no better person uh, than Dr. Matt Sorensen, who has a ton of experience in medical education leadership, uh, to give us a little bit of the data on what this looks like. So we'll start with a case. An early exposure to gender bias. A woman medical student is interested in urology. She sets up an advising meeting and she says she's been told, you can have a career in surgery or a family, but you can't have both. Dr. Sorensen, how would you start by counseling her? Pleasure to be here and thanks everyone for joining us for this really important topic. Um, I think that we all recognize that having a family in medicine in general uh, and having children can be challenging um, because you have these additional responsibilities. And I think for many people, when you're at work, you feel like you're not being a good parent or partner. And when you're at home, you feel like you're not giving as much maybe to your career. But I would, I would tell this woman that um, she's been advised incorrectly and that it's wrong. I think that um, it is a challenge for everybody and the goal is to strike a balance. Um, but if you uh, set up guardrails and you um, have open and honest discussions and you work to find that balance and have the support around you, um, both at home and at work, then it, it absolutely is possible to to have a, a family and to, and to also have a successful career in surgery. I think it's very interesting though that... Um, so just to repeat for the live stream at home, we have students in the room. Have you experienced this in terms of being told or suggested uh, that this distinction between career and family uh, for a career in surgery and neurologic surgery uh, is not possible? You're welcome to come up to the mic. We're a small, <laughs> informal group um, and look forward to the discussion. Come on down, Callie. I think that microphone was maybe glued into the <laughs> post. <laughs> This is Callie's sure. first AUA, everyone. <laughs> um, I have absolutely been told this by advisors. Um, both surgical advisors and then other advisors. Um, I'm coming from a DO program, so it's also an added barrier. And I have been, yeah, warned pretty, not warned, but encouraged to prioritize what I want at this stage. Um, and that surgery is a really ambitious goal, um, especially if you do want to have a family. Um, and I'm married and don't have any children yet and intend to, so it's, it's a very real um, concern. It weighs pretty heavily on, on kind of my efforts in progressing and, and kind of weighing those things and feeling like you kind of have to give and take and figuring out which ones to give and which ones to take. 
Thank you for sharing. I think yeah. you speak on behalf of many students that we see, don't you think, Matt? Yeah, thanks for being brave. Um, it's, I don't think this is like a very creative case at all. I mean, it is something that I think happens very regularly. And I would bet that if you, that if we asked our female medical students that come through, I think most of them, if not directly, have it's been implied in discussions that they've had. Um, I think there is a general, you know, positive reinforcement um, that I, I would say that that also is not something that men experience, not nearly to the same degree. And so this bias of negative reinforcement of women to consider what your priorities are and what's really important to you, right? That's the way that it's phrased. Um, and maybe a lack of being really encouraging that that definitely contributes to some of this. I think, um, you know, we are fortunate in neurology that um, our balance between work and home is, is maybe able to be a little bit easier than it would be if you were a trauma surgeon or a neurosurgeon or you know, some of the other um, folks that tend to you know, truly live in the hospital when, when, they're, when they're at work. I think that in many cases, um, women also have fewer mentors that can help to tell them that that's not true and help to shepherd them with some of the decision making and really a role model they can look to and and think to themselves, like, I want to be like that person, and I could be like that person. Um, it's very clear that um, if, you're, if you are at an institution where there are very few people who are like you, it's very difficult to think that you could be what you can't see. Um, and I think that's true for, by gender, but that's not the only arena where that's really important and, and, and definitely uh, very obvious that institutions that have really strong female presence, it's much um, easier for them to to recruit women because they can they can see folks that they identify with. Um, I think it's also true, and um, and probably doesn't need to be said, but probably still needs to be said that you know from a qualification standpoint, um, there is not a difference between the men and the women that we are seeing go into medical school and then also into urology. Um, but they sure are described differently in their letters. Um, and I think that if you, uh, Pauline Philip, who was um, a resident at UNC and then she did fellowship with us, um, she actually did a, a, a sub eye rotation with us when she was at UCSF. Love Pauline, she's amazing. Um, and they used, um, an analysis software that looked through letters of recommendation and then categorized words and adjectives that are used. And it was very clear that if your letter was written by a man versus a woman, that the way that the candidates are described is really different. Um, and, oh, sorry, that's the backwards. And an example of that is that um, if, you, if you categorize some of the words that tend to um, be more um, in one of these categories, uh, you know, either a positive or negative emotion, certainty, um, achievements, um, risk categories, um, their uh, abilities, that there are differences in the way that male authors and female authors describe um, the people that they write letters for. And, and male writers tend to be more assertive and describe leadership and use power words. And um, female letter writers tend to use more collaborative, nurturing, um, and more supportive, like, um, or community building um, phrasing for some of their, and they, women also write longer letters. So I think um, maybe that's a, uh, an investment that um, they feel in the process greater than their male colleagues. Um, it's also very clear that the, some of those uh, questions that um, people can be asked, all, all of these are illegal questions that aren't supposed to be asked in the interviews, um, but the, the blue boxes there are, um, those bars are how frequently male questions got, how frequently male applicants reported that they got asked questions about, you know, their nationality or their intent to have children or things about their partner. Um, and you can see that in almost all these categories, it was much more common for a female candidate to be asked about their age or their relationship status than it was for, for a male. It's still actually really shocking to me that anybody is being asked these questions because every year we, we tell folks that there are legal questions and they shouldn't. Um, but 
So not only is it happening, which it shouldn't, but it's disproportionately happening to women more so than men. That 85% number is really big, right, if you put them all together. Oh, sorry, a bunch of arrows. So um, for this step, we'd like you to sort of find a buddy or a partner to turn to and discuss a little bit about some of the ways that you have personally been involved in recruitment um, in whatever that capacity has been, um, and then how we can help to create a, a place that feels safe and a, a place of belonging for, for, for all that are trying to be recruited into urology. And so we'll have you guys kind of chat with each other briefly about what your roles have been and what some of the strategies that you've either been part of or have seen work well or not. Um, and then we'll ask you to sort of report out some of the, some of the poignant points for you. is just looking at the person and saying, I see you, you know, and asking them about themselves. I think first, you know, we might be a lot of other people like that. Really, I think, that just shows, yeah, I can make it Yeah. Yeah. But I pick and choose. I think it's my perspective about who gets to be able to give. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we did a good job. I think we do a much better job now. Um, but to be honest, we we don't do a good job. Yeah. I mean, that's something. And then also, like, you know, I know I have to fill the programs. We don't do it. It's a person who happens to Everybody says they're too busy. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like that's changed since COVID, especially too? Yeah, I think it's definitely. I think I think that's like a CVP. It shifted everyone's perspective. Of, oh, so there's life outside of work. <laughs> and so now, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's you know we used to do a lot of things towards the end of the day. Or okay, people are here. That, oh yeah, oh yeah, we can say how are you? Now it's like people understand because there's so much life outside. Yeah. But I definitely think yeah. you can help me. So, I, I don't know. It's, um, but I think you're wrong. It's other specialties. And I don't think it matters at all. Like, whether it's general or it's still really a lot of diverse things. Yeah, if you come through. Yeah, it is. But, yeah, I, that's a, that's. How do you feel so long? Yeah, they don't. I think cause the hard part too is when once you start bringing people that look different, they have to be the first, and then they tend to bring other people in, but they have to feel like they belong. Yeah, because if that initial crew didn't, didn't yeah. then they're just going to say, oh, yeah, don't, don't go so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <coughs> I, I, that's a really good Yes. Right. Um, yes. It's not like people respond well to just yes. no. not just but having people like in terms of payment versus like money versus like feeling appreciated and like it's valued invisible and until it's accepted. Yeah, 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 until you point to work. Yeah, I think people would choose that more so than money. I mean I think. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I think maybe you know, not at first after it. They make a mistake or two, then I think yeah. they don't realize this money's not worth it. Exactly. Much. Yeah. But I'm sure yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, and so, so you I, I think it really is. is. Like, for me, I remember going through residency where, and, like, not a single attending <laughs> asked me about, like, my story. I spent most of, I spent most, like, 20-something years living as me, and then I became a urology resident. And not a single, like, it wasn't until my fourth year of residency that 
um, our kids attending was like, tell me about yourself. Yeah, what do you and I was like, oh, uh, uh, no one's asked me this. It was wild. That's great. And now, I mean, yeah. she became my like lifelong mentor and friend. Oh, that's but great. it was just so, it, it was fascinating just the kind of, how we kind of dehumanize we're dehumanizing training, obviously. And then we sort of were working with these. And her, it's so funny, she, if before you work with her on her rotation, everyone's kind of, she kind of looks a little scary. Like, you know, oh, she was like, right. yeah, she was, she was. She was. Like, okay. she'll, 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 she it's going to be a little scary. Yeah, it was the best four months of my life. Oh, wow. We would, she, you know, with, I messed up, but I heard about it. Yeah. And if I did well, I also heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. Not just sharing life. Yeah. And it was, yeah. Oh, but a little bit of And that's, that's what I, I was talking about. Um, and it's, it's so funny. Immediately, every single resident ever, that was ever on my rotation, yeah. their opinion of her changed immediately. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, they're like, oh, oh, I thought she was scary, but... Just take her course. Like, yeah. yeah, just take her course. Or like take her. And every single person. And yeah, she just made you feel like a human. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's great that she still makes her entry. Oh, yeah. I saw so she retired to Barcelona and I went and stayed with her for a little bit. And oh, that's yeah. so yeah. great. Yeah. 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 She's, oh, that's so great. She said that you might be physical too. Yeah, that was, that was the first sense. I mean, it, we yeah. looked no, nothing very different sure. backgrounds, sure. all of these things, sure. but it was just, I see you. Right. Tell me about your experience. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that, yeah. that was so powerful. Yeah. I, I, uh, All right, how's the conversations going? It's good, I love, yeah. we've got a little tryout over here. Um, well, I think like to break the ice and get us started, maybe I'll start with our, my co-panelists. Um, and so, um, how about you guys at the end? What, what are some of the roles you guys have had and what are some of the strategies that you've seen that are either have been successful or have not been successful to help create belonging? Well, we spent a lot of time just talking about our, ourselves and our own experiences and how they've evolved over time. And that, you know, part of that, that second, second part of the question about, uh, about creating belonging, that's, that's the, for me, I think, the real difficult one in, in terms of, of once you establish uh, kind of a, a, a pattern within your residency or within your training program, uh, to really make changes and to have those individuals then feel comfortable as they're brought in. Uh, to me, that was, uh, we struggled with that as a department for, for definitely for a few years. Uh, and that's something that we still continue to try, to try to strive to improve. And so Maria was talking about some of her personal kind of changes as well. So I'll pass it on to her. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, belonging. I think that word is so powerful. Um, because oftentimes when you're minoritized in whatever capacity, gender, sexual orientation, um, race, you, and you're trying to get into spaces where historically you do not belong, or, or said, deemed you do not belong, it's really, that's a really tough question of feeling like you, you actually should be there. And so one, one thing for me, my personal experience was how someone created belonging for me was just asking about myself. I think trainee, as a trainee, you're super vulnerable. And one, one thing that I always found super fascinating was that I lived most of my life as me, and then I became a urology resident. And I was kind of dehumanized in a way of like my experiences, everything I've went through to get to this place. And you kind of have to lose that a little bit to become, to do residency versus, or at least that's what I thought, and it wasn't until my fourth year of residency when one of my attendings like actually sat down and was like, tell me about yourself, tell me your experience. And it was, it was a moment of, I see you, or I want to see you, and I want you to belong. And that was like, that was a total game changer for me in terms of, oh, I, I can do this, I do belong here. Um, and so creating belonging from, I, my experience has been, just saying, I see you, or I want to be able to see you, and giving people that space 
to be themselves. Awesome. We shall be so lucky. We need every program to have one yeah. of you on faculty because you were like, you are the <laughs> master at creating belonging. It just like pours out of you. Oh, it's thank true. You. Oh, thank it's you. True. I learned it from Jane Lewis. So. <laughs> Simone. Yeah, you know, I think uh, in my role at recruitment, um, we try to standardize processes and try and focus on standardized questions and add kind of rigor to our process as opposed to winging it in the, you know, looking for urology residents. And so I think certainly that's where we start. I think a lot of it is also um, what are the recruitment materials looking like? Who am I speaking to? What messages are we portraying in our pictures and our uh, materials? Who have we not included and left out? Um, and so I think a lot about those things and, and what that feeling feels like. Any brave folks in the audience willing to share some of their thoughts about things they've experienced? So Akantra and I were talking and we got too wrapped up in the first part of the question where we never got to the second part of the question. Um, and I think we have a shared experience in that we, we focus really mostly on um, reviewing applications and the challenges with reviewing applications when we transition uh, to holistic residency review. And I think from an attending standpoint, holistic, we both agree that holistic residency application review is much more time intensive than prior ways, which was what's their board score, uh, what are their letters, and how many research publications do they have, right? That is a very brief way to review an application and that I think is ingrained it's still in many people who um, you know holistic residency review wasn't available or really talked about for many years and so to try to transition um, to a more time intensive review can be I think a difficult buy-in um, and we were talking about how we feel like that may we've seen that happen and we've also seen people not want to review residency applications anymore because of the ask and the holistic review and the time it takes and how do we um, change that mindset and increase the recruitment of faculty that want to um, review in a, in a more holistic way. So that's what we focused on. Thanks for sharing. Hi, um, Liz Tack is from Iowa City. I think, again, with my group, I focused more on the um, recruitment process, which um, converting over to a holistic review. Um, also in the interviewing, um, in order to try to reduce or minimize a lot of the bias, um, the interviewers get um, a face sheet. We've kept the picture because so many of us can remember faces but not names. Um, so we've kept the picture for only that reason, um, but it has minimal information on it, like, you know, and stuff that was placed on ARIS, like hometown, undergraduate school, degree. And then as a reviewer, it's actually refreshing because the only thing I have to review before I meet with the interviewer or the interviewee is the personal statement and the letters of recommendation. There's no 30 page heiress application for each of the 10 people that day that I feel compelled to look through. And we've even gone so far to within the letters of recommendation, it's a labor of love for our program coordinator she blacks out, she reads every letter, and she blacks out anything that relates to uh, class rank, USMLE score, anything that could potentially give a sense of bias on academic accomplishment. Um, so those are the, the easy ones when you see a number to blank it out. Um, and I think for belonging, Dr. Tracy has you know, tried to um, do a lot as far as the perspective of wellness in our department. And so once our applicants match with us, they get um, like a, I can't remember the team, he, the word he used. He said he didn't like, I don't think he likes spirit wear, so they get like team wear, you know, so they get a, an Iowa jacket. Swag. Uh, swag. Yeah, you know, yeah. like basically swag. And then um, just through, um, you know, not everybody is an athlete, not everybody is, you know, into cooking, but having different type of events throughout the year. Some are like more athletic, like if you want to do the gladiator challenge, you can do the gladiator challenge with some faculty. Um, you know, we have a, um, 
it's a United Way I Christmas basket for the holidays where, you know, donations, everybody comes and wraps the gifts and drops them off to the United Way for families in need. So there's a lot of different um, focus or focus on a lot of different type of activities to bring everybody together outside of work. That's great. Those activities that, you know, you could perceive them as being like, uh, like wellness oriented activities, like the, how you feel you belong in the group is such a huge contributor to your personal wellness, especially when you're going through something that's really tough, like your training. Um, and I've also definitely learned that there's no single wellness activity that is fulfilling for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so you need to do like 10 different things because you know, somebody might really thrive and feel better after a yoga session or something real vigorous activity, whereas that might not be fulfilling at all for, for some of the other folks. And, they, and it might instead, they, they feel really, you know, revitalized from, from something that's just totally different. Thanks for sharing. Oh, geez, wow, sorry. The, the back button is much smaller than the go forward button, but I could keep pushing it, so. Um, so these are, I think from a, from a recruitment standpoint, I think these are the, the, if we were gonna have a best practice statement or best practice activities, I think that you have to be deliberate and intentional in everything you do. I think the exposure, every step along, the process um, and to the best of your ability to uh, ensure that your faculty are also a diverse group and that they're engaged in the process is also really helpful because that, that speaks a lot. I think um, especially for the chair and program director letters, um, it should be considered the standard of care to use a standardized letter. Um, and you can run your letters through some of these software programs to, to see how you know, I also think a combined letter helps to keep each other honest and to make sure that, you know, you don't say something that could be misinterpreted or that leans in a bias in one way or another. Um, so there's some check and balance in there. But I also think a standardized letter um, really also helps to make the evaluation be more standardized and a little bit more objective. And then in the interview and the recruitment process, um, I think you have to take a very careful lens to each step along the way to make sure that you can standardize where you can um, without taking the joy out of the process, um, but also to make sure that um, these things like removing pictures, removing gender, removing, you know, whether you require visa sponsorship and your, you know, birth town and age and date of birth and all those things that are very easy to remove, actually, um, to have those be pulled out as well, because it's very clear that, um, those, some of the implicit biases can creep in. All right, I'm gonna hand off to talk about the next step in the career trajectory, and so that's a, a bit about the actual resident training and some of the biases that we might experience there too. So this is about resident training and autonomy, and so I'll go back to Dr. Sorensen, you don't have to go far. A woman resident has evaluations uh, recommending that she demonstrates more confidence in the OR. Dr. Sorensen, how would you counsel her to receive, perceive, and work on this feedback? Well, I almost think it's important, first of all, to, to find out what their perspective is, because it may be that they lack confidence. It may be that they um, are culturally more passive and respect the hierarchy of um, the person that they're working with who is almost certainly more senior to them. Um, I think that it also depends on where, so if it is a true issue with confidence, then I think for almost everybody, we feel more confident as we gain competence. And so, if there is a, there, there is also the risk of kind of a spiral that I've seen happen before too, where someone, their technical skills may not be great or their decision making may not be great. They don't get to do as much in the OR. They don't get the reps that they need because, or they're, they're um, not quick. And so they only get a certain amount of time. So how am I supposed to get better if I don't get a chance to do more of it? And so I think simulation can be really helpful there. But I also think that if it's, 
if there's a mismatch where they're lacking confidence but they should be confident, then I think that having the mentorship team and the support team and their faculty mentor and their peer group or, or whatever method you have in your program for support, um, that that really needs to be leveraged. Because I think sometimes people just need to hear that they're actually doing a great job and that they can be more assertive. Oh, this is still me. <laughs> um, there, so this was a study um, from just a couple years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine where um, it was clear that, um, that some, some of the discrimination by gender um, doesn't just come from, it comes from other aspects of the care team. It comes from patients. You know, we all see on social media the, you know, when am I gonna see the doctor? You know, or the, the misrepresentation that sometimes happens by um, patients and their families um, misinterpreting. Um, and it's, it's really tough. I spend half my time at the VA, and there are some of the veterans, especially some of the real timer ones, where to have a female physician is kind of surprising for them. Um, but I think as each year goes by, it's less and less surprising, unless they've really been isolated from care. But I think these ones are really hard for us to manage um, because you, uh, if, it's, if it is a witnessed event where you see one of your female residents being mistreated, um, it, it, it can definitely be more challenging to challenge the patient or their family or to reorient the conversation or to address it. It's, I think it's, in many cases, it's easier to avoid that conflict and to have the conversation afterwards, but uh, that empowers it to continue. So I think that, that it's important for us to recognize that this can come from within the training program, but also from the, from the patients we help to take care of. I had a question, actually. I was wondering um, if anyone knows if their institution has a policy uh, related to that specifically. You know, sometimes we will get patients on call who will say, I don't want to be treated by so-and-so because they're female or they're black or they're Muslim. I mean, I have had this happen. Um, personally, uh, depending on who my resident that day was. And um, our institution is sort of, you know, there's like words that we don't want our patients to be mean to our staff, but I don't know that there's really anybody who's gonna come down and say, okay, well, you can take your kidney stone and go across town somewhere else. But I don't know if that's the case everywhere or if somewhere is better. That's a good question. I don't, that's actually fantastic. Like, should there be a whole department in the, in the hospital that takes care of that? You know, I think it's always been on the physician themselves or the resident themselves to say, stay that line. But it would be so lovely if someone would step in on your behalf and say, yeah, buddy, you gotta go, or lady, or you know, whomever. Um, that's not okay or not acceptable, yeah. Like I said, we have a lot of policies and words that say those things, but how, how is it actually enforced and implemented? I think it's difficult to enforce um, in a level one trauma safety net academic medical center where patients have nowhere else to go. That's where I work, right? So if you have patients that behave that way, it's really difficult to say, while you might feel they should take their kidney stone elsewhere when you're the safety net, you can't sometimes say that. So I think it, it makes it an uncomfortable uh, predicament then. And, you know, we don't have policies around that. But interestingly, we have policies around uh, when we get physician advice or transfer calls from physicians. And if they behave in a uh, untoward manner, we can say, transfer line operator is on the call. Can you flag this call for compliance? And they these phone calls are recorded and, you know, they look into that further. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have a policy or situation that's akin to that for patients. But I agree with Maria. I think it's a really interesting, interesting thought. If you look at those measures of mistreatment, they're all, not surprisingly, higher among women. Um, it's reported. Uh, to occur by women at a much higher rate. Um, there also is some interesting information about what sort of autonomy and independent or entrustment um, some of 
um, female trainees get in the operating room. Um, the if if you look at some of the ways that um, you know <coughs> passive help, active help, uh, or uh, you know autonomy and independence, um, if if you look at their perception about what they get, male residents report that they get meaningful autonomy at a at a higher rate than females. So I think going back to the resident who maybe it's been reported they lack confidence, you know, is, is this a contributor that they're not getting the same opportunities as their male counterparts? Um, it's also, you know, I think most trainees fit somewhere on this spectrum of whether you are, you know, conservative and prevention focused and, and as you are working through a procedure, you're constantly thinking about um, the bad things that could happen and trying to avoid the disasters, or are you more promotion focused, um, where you're eager to move things forward and um, you maybe take risks and, you know, the, the ideal strategy is somewhere in between or one that's flexible where, you know, you move quickly when you can move quickly and then we all should slow down um, for the parts that are the, where you really need to be focused on where the risk in a procedure actually is. Um, and I think rather than thinking about the autonomy, the skill set, having a perception of um, that not, it isn't necessarily that they lack confidence, but they may be in a more prevention focused mindset. Um, and that removes some of the, um, some of the chargedness that goes with some of the terminology that can be assigned there. And then you can help to have someone where, you know, you can discuss that, you know, they, the, the way you give feedback can be focused more on prevention of an, of a bad outcome versus being more, um, more forward moving with the procedure without it being about um, the person. Um, this is also a really um, fascinating thing for, for me. Um, and, and that is, is that, you know, that one of the elephants in the room for our female applicants and our female residents is that um, this consideration about having a family, starting a family, growing a family during training is clearly a very important um, topic. And I think, you know, this is now a study that's um, over 10 years old. Uh, it was a survey that was done in 2007, and then they did a follow-up study in 2020 where they surveyed all 365 women urologists, which is incredible that that number is as low as it was in 2007. And then they followed up and asked them again in 2020, and they had kids at an older age. You know, they uh, were 10 times more likely to require assistance with getting pregnant. They had higher complication rates than the lowest U.S. income brackets, which we all know that low socioeconomic status is um, a strong predictor of having complications, um, and how long you got to take for maternity leave was related to um, how satisfied you were with your workplace. Not surprising, right? If your workplace puts pressure on you to return to work four weeks after you've had your C-section, you might feel really differently about your workplace than if you have three months. and. Um, and so this timeline of at least eight weeks, but more or less, was, um, was a important, seemed to be a cut point for folks. And we think about this as it relates to um, residency training. Um, and so this is, this is some of that same data um, shown in a different way, but uh, with some additional pieces of, of information here, like uh, you know, women, female surgeons, and it's surgeons of any type, it's not just urologists, um, they, stop breastfeeding earlier than they wanted to. Um, they consider, you know, a solid almost 40% consider leaving their surgical residency, and almost a third um, are, would be discouraging. Um, now this is when you're in, in the mix, right? You're in the trenches. So um, I think that that feels really different than if you've been in a really supportive place. But I think that the perspective that should be in place is that, um, we all should expect every female and maybe male too in our programs should start a family in this critical time period in their life, right? I mean, it is the key reproductive years for many of our trainees. 
and have the perception that you should expect that they're going to get pregnant. Now, hopefully it's not everybody all at the same time, because that would be really hard, but that you have a, a rather than um, you cross your fingers and, and hope that they don't have a, a maternity, paternity event in, in their training, um, which is not a very good strategy. Um, and I think that, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years that some of these regulatory bodies, like the American Board of Urology and uh, the ABMS, that they are um, making it easier, but they're not the only ones. I think that you know the residency, everything from local all the way up to the national leadership groups need to make it easier. That also includes your, um, your practice when you get into practice, which will be the next thing that we talk about. But I think that the, um, if you think this is just during your residency training, you would be wrong. And the attrition in, in practice is a real is a real consideration as well one thing um, I wanted to say that has been really powerful for our residents is actually to see our male faculty take paternity leave um, this started happening uh, uh, maybe two or three years ago and uh, it really motivated our residents to feel comfortable asking for paternity leave and I think even though you know it's one thing for me to tell them, oh, it's okay for you to do paternity leave, it's one thing for them to ask for it if they didn't already see that role modeled in, in the faculty, so that's been encouraging. Yeah, that's definitely a culture building process. You know, we started and had a very aggressive and supportive um, leave, family leave policy for our trainees. It was there actually was not really a policy for our faculty. And so for many years, actually for about five years, the support and the process for the residents was, you know, light years ahead of what the faculty got. And it prompted the faculty actually to create a family leave policy that actually looks a lot like the residency training leave policies. Your leave policy is amazing. Your residence <laughs> leave is so good. Uh, I'm currently working on something because the, the although the ABU is is very um, is very actually very like supportive of mm -hmm. leave. It's the language and the timing and that training is that time like you can't miss this many weeks or so. That is the nuance, and that nuance is very dependent on if you have a program director that is supportive and has a culture of support versus the program director that isn't supportive. And that actually leaves trainees very vulnerable um, if you are at those institutions. Um, because if you have a program director that's like, yeah, of course, do that, and I will write your letter to the ABU, that's amazing. But if you don't, that's where, that's where the murkiness comes into play. So I think getting a stronger, stronger language from the ABU to, so there is no nuance and it is just widely accepted as something that we're hopefully going to, to, to at least advocate for. Well, I think in you know, small, small programs like urology, they recognize that time where they're away puts extra burden on their colleagues, right? On their family of co-residents. And they don't want that to be, um, they don't want to create hardship for their co-residents. I mean, our leave policy is really good and strong because it actually it was co-created with our residents. And so we had even our male residents saying, you know, the way we're gonna, you know, you shouldn't be taking call after 36 weeks gestation. You know, that should be, you shouldn't be responsible to like pay that all back before or after your pregnancy. Like they all negotiated and came up with a basically 50% of the call that they would have taken gets redistributed and then the other 50% goes, you know, they make it up somewhere. But, and, and they're, you know, I'm, that's the culture of the family of the training program because there are some of our residents that are never going to utilize that, um, that benefit, but it was really important for them to take care of each other. Love that. Okay, do we have time for a pair share? Yeah. Um, yeah. So amongst ourselves, for any of the new folks that have joined also, you can just turn to your, your partner in your corner. Um, either of the questions, pick which one you like best, but how does gender bias appear in your everyday if you experience it? Or alternatively, related to the family issues we just talked about, how did you manage having a potential family uh, during the context of your urology training? 
and that you sparked our yeah. reconciliation. Well, so the very nice, yeah. so nice. Well, so and Ashley Cox. Oh, Alyssa, so the ACGME has a leave policy update. Um, this is very um, <laughs> six, eight, <laughs> so when did you finish it? Um, and then the union uh, unionized in California. So the resident, the resident so unit, yeah, I know. So okay. The resident union has its own so thing. In 2000 and but we oftentimes don't follow that in your And so there, because so, we never had to, prior to, and this happened in Minnesota too. Prior, like my, my chief was the first I mean, pregnant president. Minnesota, okay. the we had a first pregnant, yeah, okay. and, 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 and so that was a whole to do. Well, actually, because I think we had four residents that were that like, gave birth oh. right around the and same time. So eventually, got three men right. and, and then two right. her, and so it was kind of this big. Oh my gosh, everyone's going to be gone at the same time. Right. What are we going to do? Exactly. So I mean, she really had to advocate for herself and fight hard, but she she did it, and and I think that then spurred this conversation of. Ooh, okay, and we need to implement these things. Have and well, it uh, had health concerns during the pandemic. That is true, though. What happened when they have to work on the mess? Yeah. 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 You can't do a pregnancy yeah. pact anywhere. Yeah. 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 But that meant she would have to come back. Oh, this is pretty good. But do they like dictate to the residents? So we do. They don't. No, so that, that's... Well, to get certification, your training and had to have so many like weeks per exactly. year. Total. So I know that. Yeah. That, well, then, so then that looks like... should have been done by our... Because it ultimately, it's the PD that signs on for it. So I actually have a friend right now. She took maternity leave. Or tried to do the alternative to the at a California institution. So I ended up being her she, she knew the guidelines, she knew everything, she so had not I taken like, leave before, right. right. and she's now in this precarious just position because yeah. she but her and the PD don't have a great relationship, uh, where, yeah, yeah where, so although she's still within the ABU uh, guideline, or yeah, you know, ABU yeah. restrictions, uh, right, right, right. He, he may not let her sit for boards, because it's ultimately up to the program director to sit to Yeah, and that's what I really want them to get clear on. I, can, I know every single yeah. person that is or that's, that's ever gone through our program. Yeah, there have been so other instances where other issues, problems, issues where, issues where, issues where, where, where yeah, the program okay. yeah, members have not signed off. Yeah, there have been four months of her. A lot of people have wow. taken yeah. off. Yeah. Um, so we've never um, actually had but, a female uh, actually a, take maternity. And it's so... It, we she now have that that three children who became... You were born during residency. Uh, well, almost three. She's literally ready to have birth any day now, but she's the chief now. Mm -hmm. She had mm -hmm. her first baby during the age yep. year, so that whatever, was kind of like advice that she had given her junior. Yeah, yeah. have your pregnancy during the research year, but then research yep. year she could be so started so early because yep. of the day that they don't sign off, even as long as she ended up like so long It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it should be, and the reason why is probably because it should be, we are at all the maternities. Yeah, we need to be, yeah, we need to be, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, everyone has the right to be. Well, I, I think and like what, it comes to women, what then has to happen is to figure like out a way in residence to you're dealing with infertility. Sure, I've been I've been I've yeah. I, I, I totally hear that. That, 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 that I'm going to have to offer to either that 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 chairmen or program directors do to in support. Just getting clearer on this, on this, like really hammering down the language. Because the ADU is. Really, yeah, very yeah, supportive as long. They're, 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 like, yeah, they're just like, yeah, they're like, they're just like, yeah, they're just. So much great discussion going on. We're so appreciative of everyone sharing their experiences uh, about gender bias and about building their families. But we have so much great content left, so I'll just bring you back and anticipate that you're all going to be chatting with each other again shortly. Um, so we'll, you know, to summarize what Dr. Sorensen said, you know, we do need to recognize bias and discrimination in our, our learning environment. Um, we need to be able to mentor across genders and create policies that, pers you know, that, that benefit parental pursuits uh, because building families is, is part of many physicians' practice. So we'll switch now again following the career trajectory, moving out of training, but entering into early practice and defining practice as a woman urologist. So we'll start with this case. A senior woman resident wants to define her practice as men's health focused and would like to avoid female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery as her primary focus. So Dr. Yuloko, as an expert in all things sexual function, how would you counsel her? Um, so my, my counseling is going to be very uh, biased. Um, so I would counsel her. I would actually first ask her to check in with herself. Why? 
Like, what is it? Like, really actually think about why it is that you do not want to see women at all. And, you know, what, and, and oftentimes it could be for very re various reasons, but there is a, um, an unspoken uh, discrimination or bias that women are difficult. Um, and that's actually one of the, the my, my big research and advocacy is that women aren't difficult. We've just been practicing the science behind women. If we look at the science, the history, all of this stuff, it's, it's, that's, that's the difficult thing. We as a medical community and as a scientific community have not been doing a good job for women. And thus, because we lack the scientific knowledge, the scientific data, and the, we have then deemed them difficult when in actuality they just keep coming back asking for help because we're not helping them. And so framing that and then I would show her all of the data and all of the research and hopefully I would change her mindset because you can also do men's health and actually men's health is even made better when you can also focus of, on, on their female partners if they're in a heterosexual relationship too. Because it does come into play in the overall sexual health aspects of things. So um, that is how I would counsel her. It's very different, but that's my, that's my bias. All right, so gender differences in practice patterns. Um, so, Fewer women report performing inpatient procedures, um, and there's obviously a gender bias um, and limits and influences and in practice patterns for women in urology. Um, and so this actually, th this is an important fact because inpatient, pr from a reimbursement standpoint, um, so inpatient procedures tend to have a little bit higher, um, re well, they have higher reimbursement for um, personnel. And as someone that's also, does, uh, I, don't, I do comprehensive sexual health for all genders, and I know that when, because I chose to take care of vulvar sexual health or women, um, or I actually make, I make, I lose money taking care of women, and I actually have to then extrapolate most of my income or in my reimbursements, my RVUs for my male patients, but that's why I take a couple's approach if they are in a heterosexual relationship to combat that. But that, that shouldn't have to be as strategic, right? There's something um, inherently wrong with the system if we are, are, are making our decisions of who we treat and how we treat based off of gender, beca and, base, and because, based off of gender due to the fact of um, a payment and reimbursement. Um, and then also female urologists tend to operate on significantly higher proportion of women um, than men, um, and including in gender neutral procedures. And I think this just is a testament to, one, the importance of um, the, the women in the workforce and the urologic workforce because they do feel like, and there's been data that shows that women tend to listen a little bit more to women or they feel more comfortable um, having female providers. Um, but just because of this kind of social context, we really should be thinking about the systems that is preventing then the, the fair reimbursement of, of people. All right, and then so, other barriers with the greatest impact to professional success is the lack of control over staffing decisions or scheduling. I mean, who all here has kind of just, you know, been walked into a room and <laughs> every, everything that you, that's on your card or that you picked or you said that you wanted um, just wasn't in the room. No one's listening. You actually have to raise your voice. I feel like I'm 5'10". I have a pretty, a pretty verbose voice, but I still, it's like, well, sometimes in the operating room, it's like, no one is hearing me. No one is listening. And then one of my male residents will then say, hey, she needs this, right? And then they're like, oh, of course, you know? And, and it's, it's these little, it's these little nuances of, am I not here? <laughs> are, we, are we, what's going on? These are these microaggressions that we see. And that oftentimes, that's, that's a indirect um, lack of control, but then also lack of control over staffing decisions or scheduling. Do you have a tongue? I mean, and, and if we think about it, we are all autonomous, be we all want to be autonomous beings. We love what we do, but we also want autonomy within our um, practice patterns. But if you are not able to have control over your schedule, if you're not able to have control over if, whether or not you get an APP or a, your nursing t team, that's a big, that's a big barrier to delivering the optimal care um, that your patients deserve. So 
Um, action. So how can we show up for women at work in our everyday um, interactions? Um, we have to value parental and familial caretaking of all genders, which was kind of our, our last talk, and then recognize unpaid labor, work, citizenship, and seek to care. You know, this is the, the second action point is something that is, is to me, screams policy change um, and advocacy. Because um, so like we said, we're, as, as uh, female providers, are the patient demographic, um, female vul people with vulvas want to see people that look like them and feel safe with them, but it sh we should not be um, uh, punished or, or uh, negatively dinged um, from a reimbursement standpoint um, because, because of that. And you know, how can we then make that change? Because we can't just say, I won't see women. That's very discriminatory. Um, but, so, but how can we then make it fair? Um, and so we, we, I, for some reason in residence, we talked about fairness quite a bit. And, um, and which was kind of funny to me because really it, nothing was fair. You know, we talk about equity and in, inclusion and, and equity me, has to also talk, also has to encounter or um, has to also take into consideration that people's social context and cultural context puts them at a much further, much further behind than others, and then actually taking that context and then talking about fairness. Um, because there's so many discussions about paternity leave and uh, maternity leave, and I was like, well, one person just had her stomach cut open and the other person and now is have to be at work versus, you know, you, you, um, you, your wife, you're, you're contributing, but you're, you're not as contributing as much as our other resident. It was a huge ordeal, but we got it figured out. And that was again, talking about fairness and they wanted the same equal things, but we also had to think about the social and the cultural context of where we we're at. All right. So we'll switch towards uh, a similar topic in this early career uh, phase of the career trajectory of women. So an early career woman urologist feels like she's overwhelmed with practice and life responsibilities. Dr. Yoloko, what are the experiences of women urologists in the workforce? Oh, uh, so if this was a career advice about um, practice and life responsibilities, my advice, tongue in cheek, is to get a wife. Um, and so, and I, and I say this for a specific reason. So we know that women are disproportionately underrepresented in educational and administrative positions in urology department leadership, but why is that? Um, and the pandemic was really one of the best um, ways, I, there's a great picture here. The pandemic was really one of the biggest social <laughs> factors that showed, wow, women do a lot of work. And they take, they took on, undertook 75% of unpaid care work before the pandemic. Um, and we, we saw there were so many think pieces about women dropping out of the workforce. Well, why do you think that was, right? And, and, and finally, someone said something. They finally were able to piece, put the pieces together that it was, there was a lot of um, unspoken, um, gender dis disparities in, uh, in life outside of work. Um, so we're gonna go back. So, um, maternity leave, childbearing, additional family responsibilities at home. Um, most women in urology are married to spouses who work, also work full time while practicing more than 60 hours uh, per week. And uh, but at the same time, they're also responsible for daily parental duties um, if they don't have close family and proximity. Um, and then uh, women urologists were also older, that's uh, seven, seven to eight years older for all births. Um, so not only are we taking on a lot of the um, childbearing and, well, well, of course we're taking on childbearing, but childbearing and child rearing, um, but we also then are put at increased risk to do it if, if someone wants to do it. Um, and then also the increased financial burden of it, right? So there's, um, it's really fascinating to talk to anyone outside of medicine, um, like in the tech world and, and all of these places, they have really amazing policies for re 
uh, assisted uh, reproductive technologies that's going to actually support it versus in medicine, depending on where you're at, um, we don't have any coverage for this. And so, you know, that's, that's and it's not a cheap thing to do. And so it's a, it's a big financial investment if you want to have kids. And that's not something that we're really talking about and supporting. And I think Dr. Sorensen said it perfectly. We have, like, we have to have the expectations that people are going to want to do these things. And then how can we support them and Instead of saying, no, 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 you, you do it on your own time, and it's an additional, it's an additional luxury. Um, but instead, actually normalizing it, and then setting policies that that support it. Um, so, also fun fact: this is this is kind of the joke that I talked about. The majority of male urologists have a stay-at-home partner um, that does a lot of the domestic work, while majority of women urologists have a domestic partner also in the workforce. Um, and so. This oftentimes means that not only after a long day of work, you know, unless you have a really supportive partner, some people have really amazing supportive partners, but the cultural context of, of gender roles and gender norms oftentimes means that a lot of the um, domesticated home life work is still falling on the shoulders of, of women. Um, and the pandemic really was one of the best ways to see that. And I, I love this picture of, you know, quit whining, it's the same distance. And as you can see, her, her, her path to the finish line is, is just full of, um, of things that she has to dodge and work past, and there's just two things. And I think this is, this is just such a perfect picture of, again, understanding the context of what, how we're actually practicing medicine and what our colleagues go through day to day to get to where they're at. Um, and, and, and once we actually think about those things, that's when we can actually have, start having conversations about fairness and, and conversations about fairness that make sense. Um, so for the, everyone in the audience, what types of invisible work do you engage in? Dr. Dr. Mehta? I wanted to say two things, Maria, because what you were talking about was so powerful. I, two things occurred to me. One, um, the, the focus on you know, balancing so much at home, which we all do as women. And I wanted to share kind of a personal experience, because I know we have young folks in the audience, um, that I do think as women surgeons, you know, we have this tendency to do, 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 and we are so good, and we have excelled to get where we are, it's hard for us to say, I cannot do it all. Like, that's a big admission. And I certainly struggled with this as a young mother, young physician, um, you know, that guilt to even acknowledge that I cannot do it all. And it seems stupid to me now, but like I felt so terrible hiring a housekeeper to come and clean my house. And I was like, oh my God, I am a failure as a human being that I cannot like clean my house. And it seems silly now, right? And now I'm like, gosh, why did I not do that earlier? <laughs> why did I even attempt to do that in the first place? But um, I think cutting ourselves a little slack on the things that are really not important um, is, is so essential and maybe you need to hear it from somebody else because I, initially everything seems important and I definitely needed to hear it from somebody else like cleaning your bathrooms, mowing your lawn or whatever else like watering your garden is not important to your daily life like hugging your children is important <laughs> so outsource everything else and like do the things that are important uh, and I think that message needs to come at a much earlier time um, and then the second point I was thinking, because you were talking about family building and assisted reproduction, we had a great session on this at the SWU meeting in um, January uh, about how challenging this is. And there are, there is, I think, a growing movement in medicine. There should be at least to support families. Um, and if you all are at institutions where there is no support for family building, for infertility care, I would engage you to get in touch with your HR departments. We certainly did at Emory, and um, we have a great benefit, you know, $20,000 towards IVF, which it's a nice chunk of change. It's amazing. Um, and that is open to residents, to nurses, to anybody, to the men in, uh, employed by Emory. So um, it's a huge benefit, and uh, I think engaging with HR will make yeah. that happen. 
I, so I, um, that first point of letting go of the shame of, of, <laughs> uh, of, uh, being able to do it all and have it all. And, um, I learned this, uh, in fellowship actually. So, um, <laughs> we have a mentor that is just brilliant, amazing, awesome. So publishes a ton and you're like, how is this happening? Are you running a full clinic? You're doing all these things. You've given three talks today and <laughs> you're like, it runs a journal. And then you realize that they have a wife. They have a wife that runs everything, that does literally everything. And that was actually very freeing to say, you know, I want that. I want your career. I want your career. How did you do it? And I was like, oh, you need a wife. That's what I like. And that's why I say I say that. And I, it's in jest. It's tongue in cheek. Right. But it, it but it is true. None of the other outside of work things are handled or taken care of. They're all taken care of by someone else. And so that gave me permission to just like, all right, well, I don't need this. I don't want to do that either. I don't want to do that. These are the things I'm going to focus on and I'm going to say, I'm going to be unapologetic about it because that's where I want my career to go and that's the success I want. Everything else doesn't matter. People matter. That's, that's what matters. I just have a, a um, comment on that as well. I'm a residency program director in Canada. Uh, and so um, I think one of the other things in terms of teaching the students or my residents, the art of delegation is what I call it. So if they tell me they're going home to clean a bathroom, I freak out. Um, so they need to, man <laughs> and I treat the, the men and the women the same. So my male residents, they need to know how to hire a nanny um, because that's going to be part of their responsibility when they have children. And, and the women need to know how to, like, well, they all need to know how to do it, but hire people just as you say right like yeah you don't have time to do that but I think it's really important to stress not only to the female residents but to the male I, residents I as well. I love that point yeah That's... and actually it's really interesting because in my department we've just hired a bunch of young male urologists and their wives are all professionals and so they're the ones coming to me and my other female partner to say where, where, how do you hire a nanny and we need the contract and and so it, it's really neat to see the work being distributed evenly yeah it, it's really awesome when um the male colleagues that also have a working um, spouse, they tend to be the ones that are like, oh, I see what you're doing because you know, my spouse is also working as hard. Like, those are the people, those are the, those are the people that tend to be the best allies too because it's a, directly affecting them as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's an amazing, that was a great point. All right. So. so maybe for this pair share, instead of a uh, sharing, you know, uh, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Loco, um, can you give a couple um, examples of invisible work you do as a woman in urology? Ooh, I, I used to do. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the invisible work that I do um, is. Um, so oftentimes, well, at least in residency, when there's a, a you, know, you know, plan plan this party, plan this event, plan any sort of social event was typically planned by the women. Any sort of departmental uh, thing, like teaching course or or anything, was typically always typically planned by the women too, and. You know, I can't decide if they were just kind of like, well, since no one else is going to do it, we'll just do it versus I, I kind of I went to the point of just saying, like, I'm not going to do it. I, so I, I very, <laughs> I very much don't. Um, I've never really uh, I just got to I just uh, before talking about fairness, I, I was like, OK, well, if fairness is a real point that we want to talk about. I'm going to tell you about all the cultural context and social context about fairness. And then after that lecture, they're like, okay, we'll do it. And so I, but the invisible work that I do um, is, comes from my intersectionality of, of a black woman. So I spend a lot of my time um, doing DEI work and recruiting and talking and, and volunteering and like any medical student that wants to talk to me, I will, you know, do that. And I have friends that you know, they also counsel, but they pay, they have medical students pay them. And I was like, I will never have someone pay me to ask me how to do the thing that I'm doing. Like, especially if they come from an underrepresented background, I will freely give my time. But I understand that that is a lot of invisible work that my colleagues may not have to go, you know, do. Um, and uh, that is something that I have um, like I, I advocated to get compensation to do that when I and my current job, but I do a lot of that invisible work outside of my role too. So that is a lot. That's the invisible work that I that I do, which is it's exhausting, but it's fun. Just 
discuss that. So we'll move into uh, kind of two last topics. Uh, this one is on allyship, uh, and a Twitter post uh, goes by on your social media uh, where someone refers to a urologist as a he. Um, not a bad guess in terms of the total number of men in the, in the field. But you're about to scroll past, and you wonder if it's worth it to gently point out uh, in the public square, the forum, if you will, uh, that is social media or the internet, uh, that I look like a urologist. Uh, the hashtag that identifies women as surgeons, and specifically urologic surgeons, exists. Um, maybe for the benefit of creating inclusion. So. I'll ask myself this, you know, how do you speak up and practice allyship? What does it take? Um, and the data show certainly across uh, the board, we're here at the AUA, but every other conference, um, that there's a large variety of speaking opportunities associated with our professional societies that are awarded to men, um, and that the expertise of men is recognized more <laughs> readily than women. Um, and if you don't have an opportunity to be at the, the podium um, and, and share your expertise, then you might not very well be recognized as an expert. Um, but if, if you're not, therefore, you know, in those spots of leadership, um, eh, but in your everyday work, you, know, you, you might identify as a urologist and you want to speak on behalf of urologists, uh, you then get into the issue of, well, let's say you do speak up and, and someone does not take kindly to this. I share a few examples here um, where uh, a man all might be uh, kind of underway at a conference. Um, and if someone goes to speak up and say, hey, you know, for example, in this issue of um, FPMRS, could you have found a woman speaker? You know, is it possible that there's more than zero potential experts who are women in the field? And the reality is it is probably possible. Now, they might not have found you, but the onus could be on you to find them. Uh, so one of our colleagues, Dr. Patel, uh, Nishant Patel, um, who is also married to a, a female physician, uh, took the time to suggest, well, hey, you know, I see you guys have planned this meeting. Uh, it looks like a great meeting, but I think you can probably find a, at least one expert. Um, and, and you see in the public square what, what, what goes on to kind of occur is that this common myth that increasing diversity or representation is at the expense of excellence. Um, when it's probably the opposite, right? That those women who have uh, gotten to that point have done so despite the barriers uh, um, that have been placed in front of them. But what does it take to speak up in these public settings? You know, you have the trolls and the internet folks who want to engage in a fight. This is social media, it's the internet. Is this real life? You know, maybe it isn't. Is it worth getting involved? Um, but I think this is a good example of, of an opportunity because uh, when Dr. Patel did speak up, um, it was powerful. It was noticed by colleagues uh, who are in my community, in my networks. We saw him taking a stab at saying, hey, this isn't fair. We appreciated him using his privilege to call that out. We appreciated him doing that so that perhaps we didn't have to call it out in that public square where we know the response to us would be of much greater backlash. Um, and this is powerful. This makes you feel like someone has got your back. So I think what we're dealing with as it relates to microaggressions is the opportunity to speak up, but there are many barriers to speaking up, and, and those range from that fear of getting it wrong and planting on your face and saying something sexist or racist, not intentionally, but nevertheless the impact is there. But as we look at women within the, the system of medicine, you know, they're faced with discrimination as it relates to their workplace. Professional societies like the AUA have their own role in advancing women into leadership positions or into speakerships. I think we can all recognize that the, the history of the organization to never have had a female president uh, is by design, it's not by accident. Um, and that could be changed if intended uh, intentionally. Um, but professional societies then reify this sexism within their own systems. Um, and the AOA has done a lot, including their DEI task force and now their committee, to address the policies and procedures and the governance under, underbearing these professional societies and change them. Um, but this is also then also intermeshed with academic publishing, and we see the data showing that women are, are publishing less or being cited less, um, and that their, their science is not uh, disseminated as much, uh, which influences the reality that over the course of the last 35 years, at least within academic medicine, that women are no more likely to become full professor. No improvement in 35 years. Um, means that we got to really try something else. And so I think for those of us who are leaders in the room or want to be leaders within our institutions or in our local networks even, we have to frame and think about gender equality not as this issue of wokeness but as inclusive excellence. That the definition of inclusive leadership uh, you know, means that you use your privilege um, and your platform uh, in order to uh, pull up those you know, who are either coming behind you or who not have had the same benefits that you have had. 
Um, and I think the reality here is also that the, the men in urology have an opportunity to be great allies. You know, they have sisters, wives, and daughters who are in the workforce. Um, and they just might not have the same lived experience as the women in, in their workplaces. And because of that, might not yet be open to or see that kind of invisible labor. And so, you know, through the census, uh, we see that while women do uh, understand and perceive gender bias within their usual workplaces, that men are largely oblivious to that. The, um, and so, you know, asking for help, certainly, or, or speaking up, I think, is, is really our message in terms of allyship. I'll skip this one um, and, and say from an action point of view, then what is the goal? Well, I think both men and women can develop gender awareness and gender intelligence and, and recognize feedback, recognize how women themselves uh, have internalized sexism. Um, you know, we see this commonly in the example of women engaging with women nursing um, and the performative niceness that one might need to engage in or <laughs> the task sharing and the boundary relaxing that I think most women surgeons recognize they do in the operating room to, to keep the peace and be successful in that assertive role to ask for instruments with a please and a thank you. Um, we recognize that labor and that burden, um, but it is very useful when a male colleague calls that out and you don't have to, you know, you know you have, that they have your back. So we'll move into that final portion of the career trajectory, you know, again in the attending phase here, and talk about sponsorship. And it's my, my thrill to have Dr. Chang address this because uh, he walks the walk and talks the talk as it relates to sponsorship. He's a former award winner of the Society of Women in Urology Mentorship Award. And so, you know, let's say, Dr. Chang, you're faced with an early to mid-career woman who is building her national reputation towards promotion. How do you sponsor women urologists? How do you recommend that male colleagues in your position or stature engage in active sponsorship? And maybe they don't have personal relationships with women in their practice. Um, how would you suggest and recommend that they start? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have actually, um, you know, people talk about mentorship and role models. My chair was actually uh, a, 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 an incredible role model for me in terms of his ability to include and to encourage everyone. So that's how it started. So if I have someone early uh, in their career, and we're, we're fortunate that, that we have, uh, we have uh, a, a significant number of, of women on our faculty early in their career and, and, and later in their careers as well. The first part, I think, is encouragement. I, I, I think that, um, that too few women, as they enter their careers, um, they, they don't have, um, I don't think they have as many role models or, or, or visionaries that they can see that can say, hey, these people have been successful. That's changing, that, that, that needs to change, but actually encouraging every one of our faculty, but specifically women, that you can be able to achieve this. Because I, I think early on, a fair number don't actually feel that they can do it. So to start off with is encouraging them that, hey, this is achievable, that you start off at a regional level at, 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 at sectional meetings, those types of things, you, you, can, you can do this. Then in, in terms of encouraging, them, then after that, it's important then that, that as they begin their steps forward, that whoever they are with or attached to, anything that I can do, anything that, that uh, others within our faculty can do to actually then include them in anything and everything. I, I, I was struck first actually, um, but, and I'm usually not, because I usually don't, don't pay attention to it honestly. I, I paid attention to this whole thing, but <laughs> the, ver the very first part was the uh, disclosure slide. I never look at disclosure slides. I looked at the disclosure slides, and I was just thinking that's one of the first things, I have a lot of disclosures. I have, I've, I've, and, and then I was thinking, you know what? Thinking uh, of, of how did that start? Well, one of my uh, partners, only a few years older than me, got me involved in talking with pharmaceutical device companies, those types of things. And, and, and then I'm thinking about all the different advisory boards. There's so few women. There are basically no women at all. It just struck me, just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious I'm sitting here today. So, like, they are not included. Why? They don't have access to that. They don't have knowledge of that. They don't have anyone in including. So what 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 I, I have done, not thinking about it, but I'm going to now engage, is, is that anytime anyone 
asked me to, hey, we're, we're going to have an advisory board. Hey, we're going to put a key opinion leader group together. We've got the academic group starting to do that, but actually a huge part of, of the development of, of any urologic oncology practice, uh, endourology practice, infra anything that's new out there is, is going to be based upon industry. We need to have uh, actually women involved in all of that. And so um, anytime I get asked, I ask one of my female partners, so-and-so needs to be invited as well. I'm not going to go unless she gets invited. And, and nine times out of 10, they extend extended an invitation. Uh, and so I, I, I think you, you encourage, you engage, uh, and, and then the third thing that you do then is then you elevate. You need to separate those individuals away from you. So that, that's a difficult step, but that's an important step. So you encourage them to basically say, this is possible. You engage them into activities where they will succeed because uh, honestly, I'm not gonna make that effort unless those individuals are really gonna make the effort themselves. And we've been fortunate that we have women that, that, that do that. And we have all our young faculty that we've, uh, we've pushed forward uh, have fortunately been quite, um, you know, quite pursuant to that. But then the third part of that is as you elevate them, I need to separate um, because they uh, need to stand on their own in terms of what they're able to contribute, what they're, be, what they're able to do on any program, on any article, on any, uh, any academic mission that they may involve in. And that could be within the faculty uh, uh, presence, that could be on the academic stage, that could be the educational stage, research stage. And so as, as time goes on, my name is off of that paper. I don't need to be that. That that uh, person who's building the career, that female should be the senior author. She should be the first author. She should be on the panel without me. She should be at this advisory board without me. And so I, I think it's kind of a three-pronged um, step. And uh, unfortunately, honestly, it's still in the academic world it's still a lot, and you've said this long, it's who you know. And if those people that you know are, are people who are supportive, they can make a difference. And the issue now is we need to have more people to know other people, and we need to know, and we need to have those people then understand the importance of educating and elevating others. Thanks for sharing so, all of those examples. Yeah. I'll invite you up. So yeah, there. I've got a few uh, slides here. So I, I wanted to actually not really start with what I started with is what I wanted to start off with is, is I wanted to thank uh, Simone and Akanksu because they put all the slides together. They did all the work. And then they were kind enough to ask me, would you, would you be in involved in this? I said, well, gosh, oh, what can I do? Oh, oh, oh no, we, we, they've, they've done basically everything. So every slide that, that's put together, I, I really appreciate their efforts and the amount of work and, and time that they put on. And how much I've learned when you look at kind of the differences in terms of the advancement promotions and awards, if you, if you understand that that next step from assistant to associate, from associate to full, takes more than a year for, for uh, females as a group, and then if you look at the number of awards that are, are granted, it, it, the number in terms of, of how few they really are, are quite telling. That, that's starting to change. I think the organizations are starting to understand that, but it's still quite at a deficit. Um, these are some things that, 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 that to me also, I, I were totally unaware of, wouldn't have realized is the fact that actually articles that are written by female uh, 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 clinicians or, or researchers are actually less likely to be cited. And in fact, part of that I think is self-promotion by men. It, and, and I think it's a difficult, it's, it's difficult to, to self-promote without, without boasting and, and, and we're in a day and age where there's a lot of self-promotion. But men tend to, um, to, to kind of, of toot their horns uh, a little bit more. They tend to say that their work is groundbreaking, that it really is different and unique and, and promising. And uh, some, of the, some of my friends that I give the biggest grief to are those that are actually um, the, 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 the most self-touting in terms of what they've done. Um, and so I, I, like, I like to kind of put them in their place. But so um, 
the action step that, that's outlined here in this slide is, you know, the mentorship is important, but then understanding that, that taking that beyond of actually helping that individual get that position, get that role, get their, that, that speakership, uh, those, every little step makes a difference. Uh, and then it's on that individual then to succeed. Uh, so I'll leave this yeah, to you know, Simone. Yeah. This is also from Dr. Silver's uh, report. And I think many of us, um, when we're asked, you know, why wasn't there a woman president of the AUA or on a panel, et cetera, um, you know, she really describes the rationale that I think we can tackle this issue. And that's that meritocracy, you know, the idea that there is no qualified woman um, t the, tends to fall apart when there's an inexorable zero, the, the presence of no single woman, because it's challenging for reasonable people to believe that there are essentially no qualified individuals from a particular group that could have been hired or promoted. Um, I think if you think of this in terms of race, for example, um, if there is, if the, the lunch counter is desegregated, then we should see people both black and white at the lunch counter. But if there's not, then we understand that Jim Crow is, is at play. And so we, although we might see that you know, it's possible if there's really only one person that has ever been in this position, the system itself, in addition to potentially the individuals, has discrimination and bias within it. Uh, which means that we then have to make institutional or systematic change. So next issue is, is just culture and equity. We'll, and we've touched on this a little bit, but a mid-career woman is considering a new position, moving and thinking about salary negotiation. So Dr. Chang, what are the uh, signs of a practice or an institutional culture that promotes equity? How do you talk money? Yeah, I think that's hard for everyone, honestly. Uh, I And the... Um, as you, as you come in uh, to any institution, the question was like, you know, what are the signs that actually that they're, they're making a difference? And so I, I think really the, the first way I would answer that is look at the institution, look at the department, look at the division, look at the teams, uh, and, and see who's there, why they're there, uh, have those individuals been set up to succeed? And so as you see that, then you understand that that, okay, part of that you know, recipe to success is being compensated fairly. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. And so being able to stay up front that, yeah, I understand that, that compensation is difficult for everyone, but understanding and promoting the value that you bring. Uh, and so I, I think that's what I really emphasize because our, you know, I, I have uh, the advantage of not necessarily, of not being the chair. And I've had these confidential discussions are like, well, what do I, what do I say to our chair? I say, well, you, you, you need to be strong, because uh, you really do. You need to be an advocate for yourself, but at the same time, you need to be prepared of, this is what I bring. Um, so these are some of the uh, slides, that, and some of the numbers were mentioned earlier about the disparities in, in salary, uh, that difference in the median of more than $80,000, and then understanding that uh, female urologists provide many more hours compared to their male counterparts in terms of activities that in fact are not easily measurable and in fact are not easily uh, um, uh, taken into account in terms of remuneration. Co oh, I didn't even know this. I did write that paper. Yeah, the compensation <laughs> by, by industry, yeah. Um, women urologists earned half as much, yeah. And so, I mean, that, that, that difference um, is significant and, and Understanding that I think is important up front. So, you know, as an individual institution, these are actually certain uh, goals, certain things that that uh, individuals themselves can take, and hopefully those around them can also support. Um, amplifying the fact that uh, what that individual can bring in terms of mentorship, sponsoring, uh, and hiring other women to help actually increase the sphere of influence, I think is important. You know, giving credit. I, I think that's something that, that uh, many of us aren't necessarily very good at and we don't do as much as we should, but being able to recognize those individuals and you know, specifically, I think, I think the AUA is getting better, I think our societies are getting better, but we can get oh so much better. Uh, recognizing the bias, understanding the bias, avoid denying or rationalizing the reality of the gender pay gap, it is there, it's real, and I think 
Uh, I think chairman and I think leaders are starting to understand that better. They, they, the next step to understanding and being educated is to make the next step and actually eliminate that difference. Um, uh, this advocating for blinded review, I, I, I struggle a little bit with that point because every department has a different way that they do compensation. Some are totally blinded, some are totally open, et cetera. But the, the fact that someone can come in um, uh, with data from either national surveys or others saying, hey, this is what this individual gets, quote unquote, an individual, and this is what I uh, am worth, I think will be very important. Um, understanding uh, the, the, the differences in terms of, of the, the uh, within the gender group, looking at the differences, this is practice managers, the actual numbers of what you do. I think that's helpful, but you also need to take into account and try to value the things that are not necessarily directly uh, able to um, be, be caught in any type of P&L sheet or any type of, of straight RVU evaluation. Um, reporting the results of the salary assessment, I think, are important to everyone. And then implementing the strategies then to narrow the gap, showing the differences in terms of compensation, what we can do, in fact, to improve that, and then tracking these outcomes. So um, this pair share, have you negotiated both successfully or unsuccessfully? I can say yes and yes. <laughs> Okay, and you learn more from the unsuccessful as, as, than you do from the successful. Uh, and uh, negotiation is a, you can learn negotiation skills, okay? But to carry out negotiation skills uh, takes some, um, um, some practice, uh, that's number one, and, and some personal stake in the game. It's easy for me to negotiate your salary because you don't have a, st I don't, I, I, yeah, I want you to do well. But when it's your own salary that you're negotiating, it becomes much more difficult. So, I mean, my only, my only uh, kind of advice regarding that is actually you should practice. You should, I, I've, I've told our younger folks, all right, I'm here, tell me what you're gonna say. Uh, and actually going through that process. And there, there are different strategies that you can employ. But I mean, to me, honesty, I think is always the best. And then understanding and, and trying to measure your own worth and value, I think is very important. And negotiation, most of the time is a two-way street. You're, you're, the chairmans have certain kind of, you know, th this is the top I can go. And, and the ones that are honest, they're gonna start off with not that top line. So you can usually negotiate up a little bit. Um, but those are my thoughts. I don't know if you wanna do a pair share or have others discuss. Anything you guys want to add? You know, I would add, I think, when teaching women to negotiate, great place to start, but it's, it's difficult to have the folks that are affected by discriminatory systems fix those systems. They're not in a position of power to do so. And so, you know, I see my role as also not a chair, is to try and provide them with information and, and context and background so that they can make the arguments. I think the other issue here is that it's also effective for women to not necessarily be negotiating on behalf of themselves because they might be perceived to be demanding, um, but to find the ally to make the arguments on their behalf. This is also, again, on, you know, additional burden is to f find the mentor to speak on your behalf. But I think those are the strategies that I tell junior faculty to pursue. You know, find out who the last offer was and text them and, 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 and what was the starting salary they were offered. If you have a fellowship and they don't, then you should be expecting an offer that's better than that. And if not, you should be making that ask. Um, and then really trying to have them believe that in their value, that you're a well-trained yeah. surgeon and going to be benefiting in a healthcare system with a tremendous practice. Great point. I just had two points to that. Um, I think it's a combination of being both a woman and having um, sometimes the thought that people will see what I'm doing and they will come promote and support me and then not necessarily having that happen and also being junior faculty and saying, I really haven't maybe felt like I've proven enough to ask for anything and then you combine both of those together and it really becomes hard to um, advocate, let alone negotiate. So I think two strategies, Simone, you mentioned one that helped me is um, I, I was losing clinic time from a clinic manager for no known reason was being given to other people and I am the only person um, taking care of this subspecialty. And so I needed to escalate to my chair and say, I need time back and I'm not understanding why this is happening. And I was worried that he 
would see me as a female junior faculty asking for something that seemed reasonable, but maybe um, would it totally support me. So I had one of my male uh, mentors with me in the meeting, and he didn't say anything, and he said, what do you want me to do in this meeting? I said, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from. I want to have a pre-meeting before the meeting with you, and I want you to be there in case things... Um, I can't fully advocate for myself. And he said, done, I'll just be there, and if you need me, you can you can let me know and I'll jump in. So I think that's really helpful. Uh, Maria sort of touched on that as well. And then I think the second thing is to Sam's point that we need to be encouraged to be able to negotiate. And so I started my MBA and there are programs that pay for physicians to get their MBA, right? And I wasn't actually sure that I could ask for money. Again, I'm young, I'm a female, what have I done to earn it? And uh, one of our more senior colorectal professors, I was talking to her, she went to the same business school se several years prior, and she said, you need to ask for it. She said, I got paid through some special research fund endowment, and I said, I don't have that. Um, and she said, well, you need to be creative, and you need to ask for it, so go go home and think about it. She basically scared me into asking <laughs> my chair. Um, and I said, well, where, how can I ask for this? And I really needed to be creative. So I slept on it a couple nights, and I realized when I first started, I was given a very small sum of research money, too small to really do anything with. And the plan was, you know, if you didn't use it in two years, that you, you had to give it back to the department. So I, I emailed my, our chair, and I said, look, I, I want to learn these skills. I want to bring these skills to the department. I never used this money. Um, is it possible to utilize some or all of that for tuition reimbursement? And then I just hit sent and was couldn't sleep. And so he emailed back um, I, maybe a day or two later, and he said, you know, I fully support this. Uh, you never used that money. It's still yours. Um, but, I, you know, he started negotiating. So he said, well, you can't have all of it for tuition. Half has to be for research. Half has to be for tuition. So then I negotiated back because I was starting to feel confident like I could do it. And I said, well... If there's still 20% from the research fund I haven't used, can I use it for tuition reimbursement? And he said, sure. So I think you have to, someone has to tell you you can do it because like the combination of being a woman and a junior faculty sometimes makes you feel like you're just not in the position to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the, the sponsorship I received, um, I think really helps. I just wanted to tell those two stories. I think your comment about the clinic time is also really an important one too because I think more and more the, um, the way salary happens is becoming more standardized across a group such that, you know, if you got hired in this year versus that year, you know, they try to have there be some equality, but the resources that you get absolutely could be different. And so if they say that everybody's going to get the same amount per RVU, everybody's going to have the same targets, we're going to make this all even, but you can't get OR time, you can't get block time, you can't get clinic time, you get fewer rooms for your clinic, everybody gets their own MA and you have to share, you don't get a scribe, the residents are never in your clinic, like all these things that clearly make a difference in how productive you can be. Um, those are, you know, it may be that actually there isn't a lot of place in the actual salary part, but the resources are definitely negotiable. I want to say something about pay transparency. Um, I, this is my favorite story um, anecdote about this is I have two friends married to each other, orthopedic surgeons. One's a foot and ankle specialist, the other one's a hand specialist. In theory, hand specialists make more money um, or get reimbursed better. Um, and uh, her and her husband, he was one year above uh, her in training and he got the job first with the idea that she would then get her, her job once she graduated fellowship. So he got a signing bonus of like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. Um, and when it was her time and, and they are married to each other and the company knows this is like the whole big sell that's, you know, the hospital obviously knew. And when she gets her, um, her contract, she got a signing bonus of $20,000. And, and, you know, this is just how just so pervasive it is because if she didn't have a husband <laughs> that she mm -hmm. could obviously tell talk to and also the the fact that the hospital decided to just pay her less than him for no no reason there was no reason uh, <laughs> other than what we can assume 
And so she went back and negotiated. She actually just deliberately asked, like, why did you pay my husband more than me? And they're like, oh, oh gosh. Uh, and then they gave her the money. And it's just, this is kind of that, like, unspoken um, barriers that women face that, you know, when we say, I feel like something's wrong, it's that it, it is. And, and that's where pay transparency really comes in handy. And obviously that's not the, the definition of pay transparency in that regard, but that was what pay transparency can look like for people. All of these are such great examples. I thank you all for sharing this so personally. Um, and as we kind of finish off here with actions, we've talked a lot about being a deliberate and intentional sponsor and a mentor um, and how we can have male allies who are mostly uh, in leadership positions with theology, cross-gender mentoring, um, so that we can advance women's careers effectively uh, because ultimately we can't and shouldn't expect the women of medicine and neurology to solve these problems by themselves. It belongs to all of us and outsiders can't uh, easily uh, change the system. But this is where allies come in and we can all be allies. Um, I think urology as a surgical subspecialty has the opportunity to lead in this area um, and, and advance women surgeons to be successful, really ultimately with the outcome of bettering our patients. Um, so that the poor portion of the workforce that is now, you know, more future and female will be able to take that training and expertise and deliver it to the care of uh, urology's patients. And so thank you so much for all of you to be here joining us on a Saturday to share your personal stories, to come to the mic, uh, to interact. Uh, I think all of you have potential great power in your own local spheres of influence. I hope today's conversation might galvanize you uh, to use that power or privilege um, in any way, shape, or form, whatever it is, be it gender or something else, uh, to create a little bit more equity in the world. Thank you.